Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Eric Geisels. I'll be hosting today's um, Sophie webinar. Um, this is the start of year three, actually, of this uh, webinar series. And uh, we're off to a great start. Um, we have as our speaker, uh, Sydney Ludwigson from NYU. Uh, she'll be talking about a monetary based asset pricing uh, a mixed frequency structural approach. Uh, the discussant is going to be Frank Schorfheide from uh, University of Pennsylvania. Um, it is going to be a little bit of a tight schedule because uh, Frank has to leave at 11.55. So uh, I'm going to make this introduction very short because both speakers don't really need an introduction. Um, the uh, little bit of housekeeping during the presentation, feel free to write something in the chat. Uh, I will. I don't want to really uh, sort of interrupt the flow of the presentation. So only if it's a clarification question, we'll sort of stop it. But otherwise, there's a Q&A at the end um, after Frank's discussion and um, and uh, Sydney's re response. And then uh, at the end of the hour, we'll stop the recording and uh, we will have an, a more informal chat for those who want to stay on. Uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, this is co-hosted also with Dasheng and Katya Smetanina, Dasheng Xiu and Katya Smetanini who are both here. Uh, welcome, Sydney. It's all yours. I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Let me just find this screen here. And looking good. You can see that. Um, Looks absolutely great. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay, so this is joint work with Francesco Bianchi, who is actually here and uh, should feel free to jump in on the Q&A um, <clears throat> or response, and Saima. And, you know, the question that we have been grappling with is why do markets seem to respond so strongly to news from the Fed? Um, empirical evidence seems consistent with this. It's, you know, it's a, it's a truism if you look at the financial press. And there's a large and growing body of literature that offers a myriad of competing explanations and actually some debate over why this is. You know, a classic view is that there are these surprise announcements, they proxy for shocks in a nominal interest rate rule, and they, they have short run effects on the real economy as in canonical New Keynesian models. Now this in and of itself creates a bit of a puzzle because it's unclear why a framework with such short run monetary non-neutrality would imply any non-negligible effect of such shocks on long duration assets, extreme long duration assets, such as the stock market. And so partly for that reason, other explanations abound or are layered on, such as, for example, perhaps return premium fluctuate because monetary policy shocks cause effective risk aversion to shift, for example, or maybe they cause shifts in the wealth distribution among agents with different risk bearing capacities or perhaps sentiment changes. All of these things could be driven by monetary policy shocks. Or it could be that these announcements impart information about the economic state that was not known to uh, markets. We'll call that the Fed information effect. Or perhaps markets are surprised by the Fed's reaction to recent economic data. Now, all of these are somewhere in the literature. The empirical facts of these um, large market responses have been established from high frequency event studies and tight windows around Fed communications in conjunction with reduced form empirical specifications. And then the interpretation of these, of these facts have largely followed from carefully calibrated theoretical models designed to show that one explanation or another fits some aspects of this reduced form evidence. Yet, as the mushrooming debate on what is going on indicates, Many questions about the interplay between markets and monetary policy remain unanswered. And in this paper, we want to consider three of them. First, these extant theories that mostly focus on a single channel of monetary transmission um, are useful for understanding the marginal effects of that channel potentially, but we would like to ask to what extent do several competing explanations or others entirely play a role simultaneously in these responses? Second, monetary announcements vary over time, clearly, and they cover a range of topics depending on what's happening in the economy. So how do these varied communications affect the investor perceptions of the primitive economic sources of risk hitting the economy in real time? Third, 
These high frequency event studies by construction only capture the causal effects of the surprise component of any communication. How much of causal influence of shifting monetary policy occurs outside of these tight windows around Fed announcements? So our contribution to these questions is to integrate a high frequency event study into a mixed frequency macrofinance model and structural estimation. So we want to examine these Fed communications alongside both higher and lower frequency data through the lens of a structural equilibrium asset pricing model with new Keynesian style macrodynamics. Now, the model and the estimation will allow for jumps in investor beliefs about the latent economic state, the perceived sources of economic risk, and the future conduct of monetary policy, all in response to Fed announcements. And the structural approach will then allow us to investigate a variety of possible explanations for why markets respond strongly to central bank actions and announcements, and not merely by delineating which expectations are revised, but also by providing granular detail on the perceived sources of risk responsible for observed forecast revisions. The structural estimation also allows us to quantify the causal impact of monetary policy outside of tight windows around Fed news events. So let me just quickly show you some preliminary evidence. Let's define the MPS monetary policy spread as the difference between a measure of the real federal funds rate, some measure of expected inflation, you can use several different measures, it doesn't matter too much for this plot, minus a measure of the neutral rate of interest, R star, this one comes from Laubach and Williams, and the blue line is this, this spread, okay, over time. Then what we do is we estimate an end state non-recurrent regime switching Markov process, i.e. structural breaks in the mean of this variable. And so that's what these red lines are. They show the breaks in the mean over three distinct regime subperiods. And the dates of these regime subperiods are given down here. And you can see there's a great inflation regime, what we'll just call a great inflation regime, a great moderation regime, and a post-millennial regime. And so you might've thought that these deviations from zero in this spread would be relatively transitory if monetary non-neutrality um, was relatively transitory. But instead we see that these deviations last for decades. And so there are uh, the great inflation regime and the post-millennial regime are really extended accommodative episodes according to this metric in monetary history. And the great moderation regime is an extended restrictive episode. So what are we going to do with that? Well, we're going to take that as model free, free of our model evidence of breaks in the conduct of monetary policy over the sample. In frequent changes, we'll use the structural model to actually assess, did the Fed's policy rule actually change across these regime subperiods? And we're just using these breaks in this monetary policy spread mean to pin down the timing of the monetary regime changes in our sample in the structural model. And this just avoids us having to establish evidence on the break dates that are contingent on the details of this structural model. We use Bayesian model comparison of different structural models to decide on um, NP, which is the number of regimes equal to three. Okay, so it's two breaks in our sample and three regimes. <clears throat> now here are the main model ingredients because it's a short presentation. I can't go into all the equations, but let me just summarize. It's a two agent model, there's new Keynesian macrodynamics, and these agents have heterogeneous beliefs. So what does this mean? Well, we have investors, they're forward-looking, they adjust their expectations quickly in response to news, such as that from the Fed, they own all the equity in the economy, and uh, they participate in the risk-free nominal bond market. So they're taking macrodynamics as given, we think of them as uh, you know, akin to um, a wealthy household or a um, large institution, that type of representative investor, they represent a small fraction of the population, but own most of the highly concentrated financial wealth in the economy. They form beliefs about monetary policy, but they take the macro economy as given. Then there are households or workers, and they're backward looking. They engage in adaptive learning through adaptive learning rules. This is consistent with evidence in, in the literature that households actually form expectations this way. They invest in the nominal risk-free bond market. We assume that their beliefs are really the key drivers of aggregate economic expectations. So think about aggregate inflation expectations, GDP growth expectations. There's a monetary policy rule. It will be subject to infrequent structural breaks. That is, 
we'll call that monetary policy regime change or shifts in the conduct of monetary policy. It's a two asset model with a risk-free nominal bond in a stock market and six primitive Gaussian shocks. Uh, there's an aggregate demand shock. There's a monetary policy shock. There's a markup shock in the Phillips curve. There's a shock to trend growth. And these four are relatively familiar from standard New Keynesian models. We're gonna add two more shocks uh, that are, matter a lot for asset pricing, um, what we'll call an earnings share shock or in the paper movie, we call it a capital share shock. This is a purely redistributive shock that shifts the share of rewards of production uh, from production between workers and investors without affecting the size of those rewards. So call that an earnings share shock. There's a liquidity premium shock in quotes here. This is a time bearing preference for risk-free nominal debt over equity. It could be driven by any number of factors I'll mention in a moment. <clears throat> and then what we'll do is we will estimate jumps in investor beliefs, not households. Households are backward looking and they're not, their beliefs are not jumping around with news. Investors though, will estimate jumps in their beliefs about the economic state, about the perceived sources of economic risk, about future regime change in monetary policy all in response to Fed announcements. And we do this by mapping numerous forward-looking series at mixed frequencies into the, the theoretical implications for beliefs, for markets and the economy, estimating all the parameters and latent states. Okay, so let me just show you two equations from the model that will help uh, elucidate the channels of monetary transmission to the stock market in this model. Now on the top, we have a monetary policy rule with shifts in parameters. Uh, these purple parameters here are what move over time with a discrete valued random variable, psi p, we will fix the break dates, that is the regime sequence, to be the one that we previously estimated with the monetary policy spread mean. And, you know, this, you can see that this monetary policy rule you, you naturally will affect the short rate component of the discount rate for stocks, which shows up here, right? So this, this is a nominal interest rate here. And it's moving around with uh, with these parameters, as well as with the state of the economy through inflation and GDP growth. So the bottom one shows the perceived equity premium, the subjective equity premium. It can shift for two reasons. First, the subjective risk premium could change. Now, in this model, how does that? What does that change with? Well, it changes only with changes in the realized policy rule that's indexed by this psi p, right? The actual movements here and with beliefs of the investor about future monetary policy regime change. So these things will move these covariance terms, right? So this is M is the stochastic discount factor. It's kind of the investor's intertemporal marginal rate of substitution and therefore move the perceived quantity of risk. And so these will all move endogenously with beliefs about monetary policy regime change and with actual regime change. Then there's this liquidity premium component. This is um, an exogenous catch-all for all the sources of variation in the subjective risk premium um, attributable to anything other than what can occur endogenously due to this perceived quantity of risk moving with beliefs about uh, monetary policy or actual monetary policy shifting. This could be you know, things like a perceived change in the liquidity or safety attribute of risk-free nominal debt, changes in risk aversion, flights to quality, sentiment, all of these things. Now, investor beliefs about monetary policy, as just mentioned, are really important uh, for the stock market. So investors, how do they form beliefs? Investors understand that there do exist these infrequent non-recurrent regime changes in the policy rule. We assume that because investors, there's a lot of Fed watching, they carefully monitor central bank communications. And because central banks very clearly telegraph when they want to change the stance of policy, that they can basically observe slash accurately estimate the current rule. What they are actually uncertain about, the bigger uncertainty is how long any policy regime will last and what will come next when this regime ends. And so this really requires you know, one to stop and think about how should we be modeling expectations in the presence of structural breaks. So what we do is we propose that for each realized policy regime, indexed by Psi P, investors contemplate an alternative regime, let's call that Psi A, that they perceive will come next. And this alternative regime has a policy rule that's isomorphic to 
the actual policy rule just with different parameters from the current policy rule parameters. So this is how they think regimes, uh, the regime will change. Now, investors then need to form beliefs about the probability of staying in the current regime versus switching to this alternative that they hold in their minds. So we'll model this with a grid of capital B, what we'll call belief regimes. These are a grid of perceived probabilities of investors that the current policy rule will remain in place at T plus one. In this model, T is roughly a month. So this is, you know, by the time you get to the next month. Investors know they might change their beliefs with new information or sentiment, and they take that into account when forming expectations. And so all of this, these belief regimes are modeled as non-recurrent Markov, uh, as a non-recurrent Markov process with a transition matrix. And these are parameters that we can estimate, okay, all of these. Then the model solution takes the form of a Markov switching bar. And I'm just, you know, we don't, I don't have time to describe, uh, define all these variables. There's a bunch of state variables from the asset pricing block. There's a bunch of macro state variables. Most of these have kind of common symbols. But what I do want to point out here is that this Markov switching bar has parameters, right, that shift depending on um, the current policy rule, this XIP, and beliefs about future monetary regime change. And the shocks here are the vector of primitive shocks that we, we mentioned before, right? Things like the demand shock, the monetary policy shock, the shock to trend growth, the shock to the capital share slash earning share, the shock to the liquidity premium, and the shock to the markup. And so, you know, we see that these beliefs about monetary policy, future monetary policy regime change, along with the realized regime, affect this equilibrium economy in three ways. There are these sort of level effects here. There are propagation effects that affect how today's state is related to tomorrow's. And then there's most importantly, these amplification effects. So this, this term here shows that this, uh, this, these monetary policy creates endogenous heteroscedasticity of the primitive shocks. Okay, so what it means is that investor beliefs about future monetary policy showing up here in this parameter here, amplify and propagate shocks that are entirely non-monetary in nature and do so even when current policy is unchanged. And so when the current policy rule doesn't change. And the endogenous heteroscedasticity here also is the source of the perceived quantity of risk varying with monetary policy beliefs and thus the subjective risk premium, those covariance terms with the SDF. These vary only in this model with the current policy rule and the expected future conduct of monetary policy through these big regimes. And that's what this is showing. There's nothing else that moves um, this endogenous heteroscedasis. Okay, one slide on the estimation. It's a mixed frequency filtering algorithm where the mixed frequency structural estimation allows us to zoom in on the revisions and estimates of the economic state and the belief regime probabilities in tight windows. Um, this is 10 minutes before to 20 minutes after around these FOMC announcements, right? Um, this is for most of the high frequency variables. There are a few daily variables that we go the day before, the day after, but most of it's 10 minutes pre to 20 minutes post. And then we zoom out at lower monthly frequencies when more data is available. And so we can filter this high frequency forward-looking data, lots of forward-looking data, market data, and other things to infer around Fed announcements, jumps in investor beliefs about the probability of exiting the current policy regime, which endogenously gives us jumps in the perceived quantity of risk in the stock market, and then jumps in investor now casts of the economic state. Okay, let's call that the Fed information effect. Then we use both the higher and the lower frequency macro data to inform the true policy regimes, the structural relations over the full sample, including the alternative rule that agents have in their mind, agents being the investors. I just want to note that the policy rule parameters are estimated under flat priors so that in principle, we could find no change in the previously estimated in the policy rule across the previously estimated regime sequence. So data, um, we have data spanning this period, 61 um, to 2020, and we have 220 FOMC press releases that we analyzed. We have monthly, quarterly, biannual data on obvious things like GDP growth or CPI inflation, uh, different measures of um, forecasts by um, you know, households from the University of Michigan or 
professional forecasters of inflation and GDP growth, um, professional forecasters of the Fed funds rate. We have the actual Fed funds rate, these kinds of things, earnings to lag, S&P earnings to lag GDP. And then at a daily frequency, we exploit the Bloomberg consensus 12 month ahead inflation and GDP growth forecasts to give us noisy signals on high frequency movements and investor forecasts of those objects. We also use the BAA 20 year bond return minus the 20 year US Treasury bond. Call that the BAA spread. This is giving us a noisy signal about that liquidity premium piece. And then at minutely frequency, we use um, the stock market, uh, the S&P 500 market cap, the current contract and six, 10, 20, 35 month contract Fed funds futures prices. These are giving us noisy signals of the market's expectation of where the Fed funds rate is going. So um, I'm just, there's lots of parameters in this model, but let me just show you the parameters in the interest of time for the policy rule. And so <clears throat> here are some parameters here. And so what we see, first of all, is that there are, in fact, we estimate large changes in the policy rule parameters across the previously estimated regimes. And you see that here. For example, if you compare the great inflation regime with the great moderation regime, you see that the great inflation regime has a higher implicit inflation target and lower activism on inflation relative, um, excuse me, lower activism on inflation deviations from target. If you compare the great moderation regime with the post-millennial regime, we see that the post-millennial regime has a higher implicit inflation target, virtually no activism on inflation or economic growth compared to the previous regime. <clears throat> And if you just compare in the post-millennial regime, the actual realized rule we estimate with the alternative rule that we estimate agents believe will come next, these investors, we find that the alternative rule has a lower inflation target than the realized rule, but investors expect more activism to stabilize the economy. So these coefficients are larger over here. So the post-millennial alternative regime that we estimate is both more hawkish and more active, and that's going to play a role in some of our results. Okay, let me show you some estimation results from the structural model. So this is um, displays the estimated end-of-month perceived probability that we estimate investors assigned to exiting the current monetary policy rule within a year over the entire sample. And so what we can see is that this perceived probability of regime change fluctuates over the sample. It happens to increase before a realized policy re rule um, regime change, which is what these red lines are. It also increases uh, at other times, but tends to come right back down quickly. Um, <clears throat> but you know, this anticipation happens even though investors cannot perfectly predict the next rule as we saw in the previous slide. Um, but it also shows that beliefs about monetary policy regime change are continuously evolving outside of tight windows around FOMC announcements or other Fed news. And likely this is because these announcements, of course, contain a lot of forward guidance on the likely triggers in the form of some sort of quasi data dependent rule for what is likely to change the conduct of policy going forward. So uh, think about all the uh, statements of Powell in the last few months about closely monitoring the inflation data for what they're going to do next. So what this result means is that as new data in between Fed communications comes in, it causes revisions and beliefs about future policy that has consequences for markets, even if current policy is unchanged. And this also says that these event studies underestimate the causal impact of, of the Fed on markets. All right, this is just to show you that there are, you know, occasionally very large jumps in markets and expectations in tight windows around FOMC announcements. Um, we see that some announcements are associated with declines within 30 minutes of an FOMC press release in the stock market that exceed 2% in absolute terms or even in the sample increases above 4%. We also see some occasions where there are big professional forecaster revisions in one year ahead inflation and GDP growth. You see that here and here. And we see some big jumps in futures markets right here and here, over here as well, and in the BAA spread. So what do we want to do with this? Well, we, I now want to show you our estimate of the contribution of revisions and in investor 
investors perceive shocks and beliefs about monetary policy or regime change in the near term to jumps in the high frequency variables in tight windows around these FOMC announcements. So what do I mean by perceived shocks? So we have high frequency filtering, plus a lot of forward looking data, plus a structural model that allows us to infer investor updating, not only of S, right? Which we'll think of as revisions in their now casts, but also of the composition of shocks that investors perceive are hitting the economy. So let me just focus on the 10 most quantitatively relevant announcements for the stock market. That's what this figure is showing. It's a decomposition of movements in each of these variables to revisions in the perceived shocks hitting the economy, the shocks that investors perceive, and the perceived probability of a near-term policy regime change uh, for these 10 most relevant FOMC announcements based on changes in the S&P 500. So we see most events imply a downward revision in the six month Fed funds futures rate, right? So this is where the data went. So look at the Fed funds futures rate, all of these bars, uh, all of these dots below zero. This is where the model um, suggested it should have gone. It's comforting to see that these uh, model and data lines, mo uh, dots mostly line up on each other fairly closely with a few exceptions. And this is something that's been pointed out in the past. So that policy more often surprise markets by being more accommodated than anticipated. So an example is the FOMC announcement of January 3rd, 2000 a run, this one when the Fed funds rate was lowered by an unusually large 50 basis points that surprised markets. But what's new here is that these surprise movements are not solely the result of a perceived monetary policy shock. And that's what this is designed to show. So in fact, on this particular day, there was, a, according to our estimates, a downward revision in investor now cast for the liquidity premium, an upward revision in investor now cast for aggregate demand and the earnings share, as well as a shift in the monetary policy shock. And these variables have different implications. These perceived shocks have different implications for different variables. For example, on that day, inflation expectations jumped up largely due to higher perceived demand. And it, there was an upward revision in, in what investors perceived demand would be. The market, stock market was up 4.2% in just those 30 minutes around that announcement, January 3rd, 2001. And this was attributable to higher now casts for demand. That's this part, higher earnings share, right? This part. And then a lower liquidity premium, this blue part, this light blue part, as well as an accommodated monetary policy shock. And so this really shows the sort of information effects that have been um, stressed in the, the literature before, but it adds granular detail on why expectations were revised. So let me show you now, speaking of um, jumps in the stock market, what happens when beliefs change? And so what we're showing you here is you can sort according to the top 10 FOMC announcements for jumps in beliefs about monetary policy regime change. Okay, so this is what this is. And that's in panel A. This is a change in the perceived probability of a policy regime change in, within a year, okay? And then in panel B, we're taking for each of these announcements, decomposing the price payout fluctuations around these FOMC announcements into various components present discounted values of subjectively expected real interest rates, payout growth, and uh, return premium. And so if we just, just focus on June 24th, 2009, this is the biggest for the change in perceived probability of policy regime change. And what we can see is that on June 24th, 09, first of all, what did the Fed say? It said, we're going to maintain, this is in the aftermath of the Great Recession, maintain the federal funds rate um, at the zero um, range, zero to 0.25%, continue expanding the balance sheet and promises to keep rates low for long, okay? What did this do? Well, this caused a decline in the perceived probability of exiting the current policy rule. That's what this shows. And that then contributed to a decline in the price payout ratio. That's this black dot that declined down here. Now, why did this chain of events happen? Well the lower perceived probability of moving to the post-millennial alternative rule, this downward revision of moving to that rule, that rule, recall, had a more active Federal Reserve, more actively engaged in stabilizing the real economy. 
that increases expected volatility and the perceived quantity of risk in the stock market. And that drives up this subjective return premium piece by a lot, right? And so that's the source of this decline in the market. Now, the dovish tone of that announcement on June 24th did support the market somewhat through the lower expected real interest rates. Um, and that's this blue going the other direction, but not enough to offset the sharp increase in subjective risk premium driving the market down. All right, so my last slide is just, I wanna zoom back out now and look at the full sample and show what happens to fluctuations in the stock price output ratio over the sample, according to our estimates in this model. And so all of these plots have the same flavor. I'm showing you the data, price to output ratio in the data. Now it's really price to last period's GDP um, in the data. And then these are the components in the model. We're gonna add uh, one component at a time until we get all the way up to the total uh, components that this is decomposed into. Okay, so the first component, this EY, is the earnings to lagged output ratio. So this is, um, I'll call that the earnings share for short. But we can say this earnings share plays a really very little role in the fluctuations of this ratio up until about the uh, year 2000. And then it does contribute to a sharp drop in the financial crisis and boosts the market thereafter. This has a flavor that's very similar to my other work with Dan Greenwald and Martin Letow. And now if you look at the difference between A and B, all we have done is add on the negative of the present discounted value subjectively expected return premia here. And this shows therefore the role of subjective equity return premium. And you can see this plays a large role in the stock market, especially in the post-millennial period. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind that return premia depend only on three things in this model, actual monetary policy regimes, beliefs about future policy regime change, and there's this liquidity premium piece, okay? Now, what we've done here in the green line is shut down the liquidity premium shocks to show you that that actually plays a modest role in most of the, there are a few times when that differs from the red line, but mostly uh, it has the same pattern. And so this really underscores the role of monetary policy in these subjective risk premium. Now, if you now compare it panels B and C, what are we showing? Well, this all we've done is add on the present discount of value of subjectively expected future real interest rates. We can see comparing these two that um, the subjective expected real interest rates supported the market in the great inflation regime, right? Especially early on, pushing up this line, right? Compare these two here, but it then dragged it down under Volcker in the great moderation regime. You see how much lower this line is than that one. Um, and so the Volcker disinflation and the great moderation set the stage for high valuations in the 90s by reducing expected volatility and lowering premium. But initially it tanked the market due to these high, persistently high expected real rates according to our estimates. Finally, the difference between C and D just shows the role of expected cash flow growth. And you can see that we don't have far to go before we match the entire series. This plays the small additional role uh, in stock market fluctuations so that we now explain 100% of the price to output ratio. All right, so let me just conclude. What have we done? Uh, we have integrated a high frequency monetary event study into a mixed frequency macro finance model and structural estimation. We have modeled here what, you know, in, in contrast to other work, including our own previous paper, uh, what we think are more plausible non-recurrent regime changes. Um, no regime exactly repeats one that has happened in the past. And we use forward-looking data to infer what investors expect for the next policy regime. And this methodology provides a rich granular detail on why markets react to news and could be used in other settings to assess the responses to monetary or non-monetary news. In the case of this particular application, why do financial markets react strongly to central bank communications? Well, it's really threefold. <laughs> First, beliefs about future policy react even if current policy is unchanged and this affects the perceived quantity of risk in the stock market. Second, the actual realized shifts in the policy rule have a persistent influence on short rates, and that affects valuations. And third, these occasionally, there occasionally, there are big revisions around announcements in the perceptions of the economic state. 
so-called information effects as occurred with the FOMC of January 3rd, 2001, when the market surged 4.2%. But finally, you know, what we do also find is that much of the causal impact of monetary policy occurs outside of these tight windows around Fed communications as beliefs are continuously evolving when news comes in. And this suggests, if anything, these event studies, which already find an impact of the Fed on markets, actually understate the impact of, of policy on markets. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. There was a lot of things packed into this paper. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, Frank um, is our discussant. Uh, you can share your, your screen. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, let me quickly. I'm just trying to get the full screen. Does it, yeah. did it yeah. work? Yeah. Okay, it, great. You're, you're all set. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to discuss uh, um, <clears throat> uh, this paper. It's a, it's a very impressive uh, uh, project. And I think I'll just uh, comment on a couple of aspects um, um, about it, uh, mostly having to do with the, uh, with the model um, and uh, um, my understanding of the model. Um, and uh, some mixed frequency uh, consideration. And I, I should say, um, as a disclaimer, um, the, I might have misunderstood, um, you know, some of the things that are, um, are going on, but I'll, I'll just um, uh, talk a bit about uh, my reading um, and, uh, um, and then we can take it from there. Um, so I, I wanted to start off, um, uh, you know, with with dark matter. So um, to generate desirable prediction, asset, asset pricing models often rely on subtle dynamics for fundamentals, uh, which are difficult um, to infer directly um, without looking at asset prices, actually. Um, and so, you know, prime examples are, um, you know, disaster risk models. Um, and uh, and long run risk model. So if you if you just look at say uh, uh, consumption growth um, or dividend growth, um, it's sort of hard to um, <clears throat> uh, estimate some of the key parameters there um, uh, that that actually uh, control the asset pricing uh, behavior. Um, and uh, it is only you know once you bring in the asset prices that uh, that those uh, parameters uh, seem to be uh, sharply estimated and and so um, you know what's the dark matter in in this paper um, it's I think uh, beliefs about changes in uh, in monetary policy regime so that basically um, you know connects that sort of key for um, uh, for um, uh, tracking the uh, the asset prices and the stock market uh, uh, movement, um, and of course their beliefs. Uh, you know we don't see them um, in any any other way, though they are sort of calibrated to be consistent with uh, um, inflation and and some other expectations. Um, and um, you know in general, um, monetary policy rule uh, coefficients are very. Um, difficult um, to um, to estimate uh, sharply, uh, just based on um, a macro uh, variables, and and here it's sort of not just the the coefficients of the policy rules, but also um, the um, uh, coefficients about beliefs and uh, changes in the monetary policy rule, which of course gives the uh, model um, uh, quite a bit of uh, um, degrees of freedom. Uh, so here's the monetary policy rule. Um, it's much simpler than uh, the one that's actually used uh, in the paper, and the notation um, is uh, is a little bit uh, different. Um, but uh, but basically, um, there there are two things moving. Uh, one is the um, <clears throat> uh, one is the target inflation rate, so this pi bar st, um, and uh, the other one, uh, the other coefficients uh, that are moving are the uh, the slope coefficients. Um, and uh, you know this st is sort of this uh, this latent uh, state uh, that changes um, occasionally. Um, and as, uh, um, as Sydney pointed out, it's a it's uh, they don't have recurrent regimes in this model. It's a change point uh, specification. So uh, when things change, they don't switch back to what they were before, uh, but rather into a new um, 
uh, enter a, a new regime or new new coefficient values. Now, uh, just for the uh, interpretation of the of the results, um, you know, there is no Q. If you if you look at the monetary policy uh, rule and and the setup, there's no there's no QE. Um, there's also no forward guidance um, as far as um, <clears throat> I can tell uh, from the model equation. Um, and there's, uh, um, you know, no informational advantage of the um, of the central bank about the state of the economy, except that, of course, um, you know, the, the central bank, um, while well, the changes come exogenously here to the central bank, um, but they know, um, I guess, the next regime uh, that they will, uh, will move to. Uh, so you can think of that as an informational um, advantage, but, but it is sort of my understanding. It's not that, you know, the, um, um, you know, the, the Fed knows more about a latent technology process uh, than actually the investors, uh, investors do. And I, I think that's important uh, for the, uh, for the result, for, for the interpretation of the results. Um, there's a, um, um, New Keynesian um, um, economy, that's one part, and then there's equ equity pricing uh, through uh, investors. Um, um, so, you know, the New Keynesian part, it's, it's pretty much a, a standard three equation setup, except um, that, um, you know, the um, <clears throat> in terms of consumption and output, it, it only covers a, um, a fraction of the um, uh, um, uh, of aggregate output corresponding to the uh, to the labor share, uh, which evolves, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, which evolves exogenously. Um, and it's uh, populated by workers who only have access to nominal bonds. Um, they, um, these workers have flexible beliefs, or, you know, the whole um, kind of New Keynesian part, they have flexible beliefs that can adapt to switching um, monetary policy rules. Um, but here, um, they actually just use a constant gain learning um, algorithm, and, uh, and they get a, a signal about inflation, the inflation target. So, so that's for the learning about inflation. Um, and for, uh, for output, they just use an uh, AR3 model. Um, so, um, you know, the investors presumably hold the capital, although the capital is not modeled in the New Keynesian part. Uh, they did do receive the capital share. Um, and um, uh, they hold equity, uh, which, you know, basically as uh, they receive the capital share of output um, as, uh, uh, as, their, um, uh, as their dividends uh, for holding these, uh, these assets. Um, and they, they hold the nominal bonds as well. So they need to be willing to hold the bonds uh, given the interest rate output and inflation dynamics from the New Keynesian part. Um, and they need to be indifferent between holding bonds and, and equity. Um, and so, um, you know, this is this is sort of, oops, sorry, um, you know, th there's sort of a, a standard uh, part to the, the pricing kernels of the investors, which you can think of the um, <clears throat> consumption growth, I forgot the exponent here. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's sort of a, um, you know, stochastic part here uh, to their preferences. And then most importantly, there are these um, uh, expectations, um, beliefs about future monetary policy, uh, which let them forecast, um, um, you know, inflation and, uh, and, uh, and output uh, dynamics. And the paper is really all about um, <clears throat> these, uh, this ETB. Um, investors are concerned that monetary policy switches to an alternative regime, um, and they hold beliefs um, uh, about what the regime might be, and sometimes the probability is high that they think they switch, and sometimes it's low. Um, so, you know, I, I think the model is actually block triangular, or at least uh, it could be easily made block triangular. Uh, so that the New Keynesian block uh, can be solved independently of the asset pricing block, which I think, um, you know, would, would sort of simplify things a little bit. Um, I was sort of wondering who's the better forecaster of inflation and output, the investors or the workers, just in the model before, before um, um, I guess, um, uh, you know, fitting, uh, uh, fitting the data maybe or conditional on the estimated, uh, on the estimates. 
Um, I also wasn't sure why firms uh, use workers' expectations instead of investors' expectations, because uh, the Phillips curve seems, seems to be derived based on, um, <clears throat> on workers' expectations. Um, and they also seem to use the stochastic discount factor of the worker, even though um, they're owned by the investor. So, uh, I mean, again, maybe I didn't understand the model correctly, but uh, maybe that's a bit of a... Um, um, incoherence or it's sort of a shortcoming and if you uh, a shortcut and if you do shortcuts maybe then doing it block triangular um, um, may not be a, um, a bad thing um, to do um, you know one one could estimate so if you think about the estimation you could just estimate the uh, new Keynesian part um, and uh, you could um, um, estimate the New Keynesian part plus the asset pricing part, which is um, what what was done. And uh, let's just ignore the high frequency uh, data part for now, because you could estimate this on uh, just monthly uh, data as well. Um, you know, so so this would shed some light on on the dark matter um, <coughs> issue to to what extent um, these asset prices really drive uh, certain types of uh, estimates. Um, and uh, you know what do we learn? Well, you know we learn obviously all the parameters that uh, uh, that Sydney uh, showed us, um, transition probabilities for the monetary policy rule, um, and uh, um, <clears throat> uh, the counterfactual beliefs such that investors are willing to hold bonds and stocks. Um, and, and so the key question really is how do beliefs about monetary policy have to evolve to explain the uh, fluctuations in the in, in the stock returns? Um, and you know one one of the things I was asking myself is how could we assess whether the estimated beliefs are actually reasonable? Um, of course, they are uh, by construction they are designed to uh, to track um, expectations. Uh, but uh, of course, what what's important for risk is is sort of how they forecast the uh, future um, co movements between um, uh, inflation and output and and so forth. And um, you know maybe um, um, there are some statistics that could be generated um, in order to assess um, in that regard what these um, um, uh, what these uh, expectations actually imply for um, observables. Um, you know, I, I guess, um, you know, Sydney was, was sort of saying that maybe things are, uh, belief fluctuations are, are underestimated, but um, to me, it seems to me, given that there are all kinds of other explanations for um, uh, fluctuations in equity prices, like in the, in the long run risk framework and the rare disasters framework, many papers uh, emphasize stochastic volatility, recursive preferences. Um, so here, it seems like, if anything, uh, maybe the role of monetary policy is uh, is overstated. Um, and then, of course, the the key of the of the paper is really to not just use monthly data. The model is actually written at monthly frequency, um, but shed light on. Um, uh, but use high frequency data and, and uh, shed light on why and how stock prices move after the um, FOMC announcements. And, and that's sort of what makes this, uh, this paper computational really hard and, and super uh, ambitious. And so my main confusion in this, in this regard was that uh, typically, meaning um, sort of in, in my work and, and some, some other work um, that I know, uh, so typically in quotation marks, uh, the transition equation of the mixed frequency state space model um, is, uh, is specified at the highest frequency. Um, but that's actually not, not what's done in this, uh, in this paper. It's, it's uh, the transition, the, the model is ticking at monthly frequency, uh, whereas, uh, you, you know, the other stuff is like at uh, um, hourly, daily frequency. Um, and so I, it, it wasn't clear to me from, from, you know, looking at the paper and looking at the appendix on how exactly the bridge equation looks like uh, to uh, to divide the uh, period here. Um, and I, I think that's important to explain because that's what, what all these um, um, results are about. And, you know, maybe I didn't read the, the paper carefully enough, but I, I, I thought that was hard to find out. Um, so just to, to summarize, um, so it's a very ambitious paper that tackles an important question using some challenging computations, both with res respect to um, <clears throat> model solution and, and computation. And, um, you know, this is sort of the kind of work that uh, uh, that I admire because it 
um, you know, uh, integrate structural modeling with uh, um, rigorous econometric um, analysis. I do find that in its current form, uh, the paper is, um, you know, quite hard to digest. And I actually spend most of my time sort of trying to figure out how the model components um, uh, work and how the uh, high frequency measurement um, uh, equation actually works. Um, and so maybe there are some simplifications like making it block triangular if it is not a, not block triangular um, right now. Um, uh, that could be uh, could be really helpful and and taking it apart a little bit. Um, and then I also have some lingering concerns that the empirical results are a bit overinterpreted in the sense that in the model, there's really not, I mean, the, the investors are not confused about the state of the economy with respect to what the current value of the latent states are, except, so it's not that the central bank in any way is revealing information about, um, you know, current demand, current latent demand, current productivity or so that the investors don't have. It's really just that they reveal through their actions information about uh, this latent um, uh, ST, uh, ST state. Again, at least that's my, uh, that's my understanding of the model. Um, and uh, so the information effect is really just about the stance of the monetary policy, uh, but not about the state of the economy in other dimensions. And again, that's sort of the way I understood the model and, and sort of the disclaimer is that I, I might have misunderstood some of the things uh, that are going on. So let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> Great discussion. Um, Sydney, I see you're diligently taking notes and you're still muted. Um, please feel free to answer uh, questions. Okay. I, I Yeah, I'm going to let Francesco jump in on some of these because he's probably going to explain it, um, some of these things better than I would. But I, um, you know, we're asked, so we estimate these beliefs, um, not calibrated, but estimated. And then, um, you know, I, in, let me just say something about the QE and forward guidance and so on. It's true that we don't have an explicit model of this. Um, also, the, the, the potential for the Fed to have some additional information is not explicitly modeled, but, um, and actually the QE, for, you know, thing is something we're working on now for a separate project. But um, this inflation target, because remember it's shifting around over time, that's really more of an implicit target. And, it, and, and so it can be the, you know, that it changes due to things like forward guidance and QE. Um, imagine that you're at um, the zero lower bound and, um, you know, you can't, um, the central bank's trying to lift inflation through QE and forward guidance. Um, that could show up in the model as an increase in this implicit target. So, um, because that's the kind of thing that would uh, ship, push down on um, inflation expectations in the model and real rates, because there is this signal component and would stimulate uh, the economy, even as we're not at, um, you know, a point where the Fed can do anything more with the nominal rate. So uh, there is this sort of indirect channel through which these things um, can operate. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, this is not the same as explicitly modeling uh, purchases of long-term treasuries or, you know, agency debt or anything like that. Uh, but it is, it is one, one channel um, where that would show up. Um, so um, I think there was then, you know, long-run risk and disasters, absolutely, there's a lot of things going on. So that's why we have this additional component in the... Um, you know, in the risk premium, that's this so-called liquidity premium. This is what we call it. Um, you know, you could imagine we use the, the BAA spread to sort of as a noisy signal of that component. It is fairly volatile. It's just that over longer periods of time, it doesn't have as much of a bigger, uh, as, as much of a big role. So um, now all of these things like, you know, long run risk and disasters, they could also be endogenously correlated with these shifts in the monetary policy, right? So we're not um, you know, it's, 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 it, there's, there's nothing that explicitly rules that out. Um, it's just that we, we, you know, we're, we're using the data and our model to, to get out what these beliefs, um, what these beliefs are. So, uh, the last thing is this transition equation and, and then I'll let Francesca. Yeah, let me, 
maybe yeah let me let me jump on that even because i know that frank has to go so yeah we we debated frank a little bit we went back and forth between uh, should we specify the model let's say a daily frequency and then aggregate and see what the implied low motion and monthly frequency would be in the end we took a, a different path uh, that is uh, let's specify the model and monthly frequency and let's assume that when we observe uh, forward looking variables intramont uh, what we are doing is observing a mapping from whatever now cast of the current month uh, investors have to asset prices so it's almost like uh, through inflation expectations uh, um, asset markets and so on you will have a uh, uh, and now cast in real time of what they think the variables for the month are going to be. And I agree we, we, we should definitely add uh, maybe a simple example to explain this better. It is in the appendix also how we do the filtering. And going back to your, to your question, to your point about what agents learn from the central bank, you are right. We don't explicitly model this a superior information of the central bank. But given that we allow for this now cast to be revised pre and post FOMC meetings, you would imagine that in the background, uh, these agents uh, are learning something from the central bank. The implicit assumption is that at the end of the month, all of these uh, gets, gets washed out. Everybody gets to observe, quote unquote, the state of the economy. So, okay, there is not this uh, additional layer of noise between the state of the economy and uh, uh, beliefs. So that we could add that, it just we feel like we already, like you pointed out, we already have a lot of moving parts here and, and we thought that it was better to uh, keep it this way. On the block triangular structure, yes, you're absolutely right. The model is already block triangular. In fact, it's solved in that way. We first solve for the macro block and then we, we solve for asset prices, including beliefs. It's just that when you do the filtering, I don't need to, to explain yeah, yeah. this to you. It's not indifferent to do it in two steps. So you want to do the filtering together, okay? But yes, in, and, and we also have versions of the model in which we get rid of asset prices, we only look at the macro block. It's just that given that our macro agents are adaptive learners, you're not going to learn anything about how the alternative regime is going to look like, no, what the probability of moving there is. What you can learn, I mean, what is the probability of moving across regimes in sample, essentially. Uh, uh, so these are, I feel like uh, I've tried to address all your points without uh, uh, jeopardizing your ability to leave. <laughs> So I, I if, but if you if you have time to stay, I'm happy to maybe address a couple of more. Um, no, I, I think that's all that's all good. I mean, um, you know, the uh, I, I guess the main thing is that they, there is sort of this gap between, you know, what's in the model and the way you interpret it. And right. that's fine. I mean, because obviously a, a, a model that, you know, doesn't have the gap would, would even be more complicated. Um, but it might be better. I mean, I, I, I think for me, it would have been helpful to uh, maybe flesh that a little bit more out that, okay, this is exactly what's in the model. And then, you know, here we're sort of taking a leap um, and sort of, you know, just loosely interpreting uh, what's going on into into model. You know, you know, turning it into this this sort of uh, broader broader narrative of um, what the relationship is between <clears throat> monetary policy and stock prices. So that's just a um, small suggestion. Yeah, that, no, that's fair enough. I think we we can uh, we should actually add the probably a bit more details <laughs> about exactly what we think the information structure is between the end of the month and the intra month. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I know Frank, you have to go, uh, so I don't want to hold you up. Thanks, 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 Frank. Uh, it's Thank a wonderful you, Frank. discussion. Thank yeah, you thanks much. for having me. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Frank. Really appreciate that. Uh, maybe I'll continue a little bit. So, so the 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 model seems to be on monthly frequency, so that means a monthly filtration of information, uh, and then I, I wasn't really sure how you then throw in these daily because that seems still to be holding on a monthly filtration but yeah does not so, so, the, yeah. Fil so the filtration is still monthly right no no so the so as i was saying as uh, so yeah the filtration still uses uh the the monthly low motion as uh, we were debating with frank the alternative would be to specify what is the implied yeah. daily low motion right. or specify the model the directly daily frequency just that we thought that that, that's, that's a nightmare even just to solve the model because then you need to say that the Fed is reacting to essentially the last uh, 180 periods. So, there, so right. we first that problem first. 
So we said, okay, one possibility, let's write the model at monthly frequency and then convert it to what implies a daily frequency. We thought about doing that, we didn't like it. So what we do is to use the monthly law motion. And so what we, we what you do at each point in time, let's say that you have pre-FMC, post-FMC, end of the month. It's like you do three times the same filter. And so you get uh, an early estimate of what uh, the data are going to be for the month, then a post-FMC estimate of what the data are going to be um, for the month, and then you get the final estimate uh, uh, at the end of the month. So what I forgot to mention to Frank is that we also think that that's what happens in reality with practitioners. Uh, in the sense, if you spend some time with the professional forecasters, what they do, they get an outcast of Correct. today, and yeah. then they use a monthly model. They don't, they don't have a daily model uh, for predicting GDP growth or whatever. So, so I think we, there is a bit, yeah, this is a key, I think the key part of the paper, and we spent a lot of time deciding which way to go. We thought that this in the end was the most reasonable for a variety of reasons. Uh, um, in, uh, not even computation, I think it's actually the same. You could do it uh, either way. Solving the model is not trivial. If you do go daily frequency, right. it could be cool, but it's not trivial. Uh, um, and, uh, and so we, Though that this was also closer to the reality of what practitioners do. Yeah, I just want to say, Eric, it's such a good question and a deep thing. I mean, this is something we spent a lot of time thinking about. But the, the analogy is like when the BEA comes along and says, well, we've got some information, so I'm going to put out an advanced estimate. And now we got a little more information, so I'm going to revise that same estimate, the same thing, right? Now I got a preliminary, and then there's eventually a final estimate. That's sort of what we think. That's, that's it. That's the implicit model that we have for investors. They're coming into the month. Um, they get some, they, they have some, some information and the Fed says something and they revise something on the basis of, you know, they could revise their beliefs about what the Fed's going to do, or they revise their expectations for the future on the now cast. Um, and then the, finally, at the end of the month, they get all the information they need and that's their final, final estimate. So that's sort of how we just ended yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we are running over time, actually. We, I, we all got carried away a little bit. Um, so I'm going to have to close the, the recorded part and we can stay on uh, for having a more informal discussion. Uh, thanks again. This was a wonderful paper. Uh, well, lots in this paper, actually. Uh, um, and also a wonderful uh, discussion by Frank. Um, please stay tuned for the Sophie webinar series. Uh, visit our webpage uh, for all the events that are happening. And uh, I thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, participating today. We are off to a great start for the third year. And this will end the recording.